Well, good evening. My name is Evan Gregory, and this is Bible Answers. We're going to be looking at the subject of repentance tonight. So you can follow along with, I have all the verses here on the screen. And um, as always, it's brought to you by North Carolina Church of Christ, located in Columbus, Mississippi. And our website is scrolling below me, is NorthColumbusChristians.com. And we also have a YouTube page, that's North Columbus Church of Christ. You can find it, subscribe to our page, and uh, we put all these videos up there. And uh, you, that way you can view previous videos. So getting right into the lesson, again, we're looking at the subject of, of repentance. And I think there's a lot of uh, misconceptions in regards to this idea of repentance. So we're going to look at what it means. And, and we're going to look at examples of what I think is true repentance uh, that we can see in the Bible. And the first thing is that you know, ultimately, repentance takes place in our mind. There's not, uh, you know, one person can't necessarily look at, uh, well, they cannot determine the exact time or place that, uh, you know, this repentance takes place. It's, it's ultimately up to uh, the individual, okay? And so the repentance takes place, but we also de do see some fruits of that repentance as well. And we'll look at that later on in the lesson. And so we have on the screen Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 18. This is uh, the story of the prodigal son. And you remember the story. And this is basically when he uh, just has a light bulb moment. And it says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and not perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and then will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And, and, I, and I think this, this we don't see uh, in this verse, okay, this is when uh, the son repented. But what you do see is you see this change that takes place with this man. In verse 17, it says he comes to himself, and uh, he just recognizes what he's doing, that it's, he's on the wrong track, and uh, that there are some things that he has to do to make things right, that we see that in verse 18. So he recognizes his own sin, and there can be no repentance until you know we recognize our own sin that we that we have sinned, and uh, that must take place. And um, continuing on, we see this recognition of sin, and, and and I think in the prodigal son, we'll look at on the screen here as well that we see him being convicted uh, by this sin. He's convicted by his shameful living, and uh, he's going to go make that right. In Acts chapter 2, we see Peter preaching to the Jews in, in, at the, on the day of Pentecost. And he's telling them basically that Christ was, Jesus was the Messiah, and that they have, that they have killed him. And after saying all of this, notice in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? It says they were cut to the heart. Uh, this, this word... This that's used for this idea of cutting to the heart is can mean uh, to pierce thoroughly or to agitate violently. That they are just disturbed by what they have heard. They recognize that uh, what they did was wrong. That it was sinful. That they you know they killed the Messiah, which is you know and you know very you know a very big deal to say to say the least, and. We, they say, what must they do? They were cut to the heart. What must they do? How do we fix this? How do we make things right? And we see what Peter tells them to make things right. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 30, he tells them to repent. Okay. So notice the repentance is not, take, not taking place yet. So they were convicted of their sin. They were cut to the heart. But they still had to repent of this. They still had to have this changing of their mind. And he says, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So this had to take place before their sins were forgiven. So we have to recognize sin, but that doesn't mean that we repented. We, obviously, we are convicted of that sin, but that still doesn't mean that re had repentance has taken place. And so we have to be careful with that. And if we just feel sorry for this sin that's not just enough there there has to be again we have to we have to make sure that we truly uh, do repent and we have this changing 
of our mind. Now, although I've just said that, sorrow does play a part in or can, can, can play a part in leading to repentance, a proper type of sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9 says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Notice that there's two types of sorrow in this passage here. There's a sorrow, you know, this godly sorrow, this sorrow that they were made sorry in a godly manner, but we also have the sorrow of the world. And so this godly sorrow, notice that it produces repentance. Again, they, they recognize their wrong and uh, they have this proper attitude towards that sin and it leads to repentance. But if we're just sorry, you know, maybe it's just, oh man, I, I feel bad that I got caught or whatever it may be. Uh, this is sorrow of the world, and it doesn't lead to repentance, okay? You can feel sorry, but it doesn't change the fact that you sin. It doesn't lead to forgiveness of sin. It just leads to, you know, it leads to death, as, as Paul puts it here, okay? So again, these things can lead to repentance, but they're not necessarily our repentance. So again, I emphasize that just because we're sorry doesn't mean that we're repentant of those things. And it is the repentance that leads us to salvation we also see it, it, that uh after repentance takes place notice that that is a changing of, uh, again a changing of one's mind and if we change our mind okay so if i'm looking at you know okay i've repented of lying right well there's going to be some change in how i operate okay most you know most importantly is I'm not going to be lying, okay? So there's actions. There's a change in action. There's a change in works. So we might be changing things. We might be stopping doing certain things. And we may be doing uh, some some other things in which we have not done before. In Acts 26 and verse 20, notice what Paul is telling uh, really unbelievers to do. He says, but declare first those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. Turn to God and do works befitting repentance. Okay. So that they repent. And also, I mean, they, they're doing works. Okay. That those works befit their repentance. Right. So they have a change of mind and it will result in a change of action. It will result in works. And again, we, we have to be careful with this at, 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 because. So, for example, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, and it's the first one it says, does doing certain things mean that I have repented? And, and a lot of times, yes, that is a case. That is the case. Uh, but again, we have to be careful uh, with that. You know, if I'm, you know, if I had a problem, if I'm tempted by something, maybe I'm tempted by uh, gambling or whatever it may be and maybe i work in a casino and i have a problem with that and if i just get another job going someplace else you know maybe or maybe i've stopped gambling and i and i'm started you know maybe i started helping poor people or whatever with this new new job you know i'm doing different things i'm um you know i'm went from gambling to, to helping people or you know or finding a better job but there still could be no repentance in that. And it's and it's very similar to the second question. You know, if I stop sinning, does that mean I have repented? Again, going back to the, the guy that's gambling, or maybe, you know, maybe you are you, you're tempted at your job to steal or whatever it may be, or maybe you're an alcoholic and you're and then you go from or go to some country or some island and there's no alcohol there. Okay. Well, you're you're no longer drinking you're no longer consuming this alcohol you're no longer a drunk okay so technically you stop sinning but uh you can still not have that change of mind there okay so as we've gone through the theme and i guess you would see a theme in this lesson is that uh all of these things are part of repentance right but 
we have to be careful and say, okay, well, this one thing, well, if, if, if we see this, well, then that's a hundred percent that they repented. Okay. Or we see them doing certain things. Well, that's a hundred percent, uh, you know, confirmation that they repented. And it's certainly uh, probably the case that they have. But, um, you know, again, I think that's for the individual themselves to, de to determine and make sure that they truly have a repented because the person on the outside, they can only see this person's activities. They can only see the fruit and, or the, or, and the change of their actions. So just be careful. Ephesians 4 and verses 22 through 32, I think this is a good passage that really sums up what it is to really truly repent and become this new person, this new Christian. It says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one you it let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. I do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, that all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So Paul is talking about this old man versus the new man. He does this quite a lot. We see that in, in the book of Romans as well. And he compares this old man, and that is you before Christ. You know, that is you as an unbeliever. And he talks about what this old man is doing. You know, it grows corrupt according to deceitful lust that, uh, you know, they're committing this sin. But he says, be renewed in your spirit and mind and put on the new man. And what does that new man look like? You know, you look at that and you may say, well, you know, you may think of this in terms of some mystical, you know, mystical change, magical change that takes place. But what we see is very practical ways in which a person changes here. You know, we see put away lying, speak truth to your neighbor, you know, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Let him who stole steal no longer. You stop stealing, and now you go to work. You change the way you talk. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for edification? So we see all these practical ways, these, these, uh, you know, these changes uh, that these people go through. That you you were doing this, but well, you stopped doing this, and now you're doing this other thing, which is righteous and holy. OK, and so that is what I think really the, what the fruits of repentance looks like. You know, someone who has repented, this is what they're going to do. You know, someone who, again, is a drunk or he's a cheat or a liar or whatever it may be. They're going they're going to toss that all to the side. They're done with that. OK, and and he's, he does not say uh, just, you know, try to keep try to stop or just do this as little as you can he says get away from it stop all of this put it all away you are a totally new man you know and this new man has no part in uh this sin colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4 says if then you are raised with christ seek those things which are above where christ is sitting at the right hand of god set your mind on things above not on things of the earth for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears in you, will also appear with him in glory. So you are raised with Christ. You, again, this he's not using uh, this term new man here, but it's the same idea. You are now, you have died with Christ in baptism. That's Romans chapter 6. You are raised to walk in newness of life. Here in Colossians 3, it's the same talk here. You are raised with Christ. And so, therefore, the old man is done away with. That's over with. And you know, now you're setting your mind on the things which are above. Godly things, spiritual things, not these sinful, worldly things. 
And so moving along, I'm going to look at some examples in the Bible that I think kind of exemplifies what repentance looks like. And the first one that I want to look at is, is Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, So King Nebuchadnezzar, he was a Babylonian king, and uh, he was he was proud of what he has, had done. And um, well, if you could read the book of Daniel, you see that the, that the Lord humbled him. He made him kind of just become like an animal living in the wild for a while. And we pick up in chapter four in verses 34 through 36 and it says, And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And at the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. And I restore, I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the kingdom of King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. So we see Nebuchadnezzar, he's this prideful in, individual. He, you know, he didn't have anything to do with, with God. And yet we see this complete change, at least at least for the time being, I would say, that uh, you know, he's just completely changed he understands what has happened and why uh, these things has happened and uh, he understands his place in relations to the lord we now see him praising god he's the king of heaven you know he can do whatever he wants to do and we notice that very last phrase and those who walk in pride he's able to put down nebuchadnezzar is, is very aware of that and so we say this 180 degree change uh, in, in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, and who he thinks is in charge. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 27 through 28, we see a situation with King Ahab. King Ahab was wicked. He was horrible. His wife, Jezebel, was a horrible individual. But we see a situation here that Ahab has, has changed. It says, so it was when Ahab heard those words, so these words pronouncing judgment upon uh, him and his family, Says, so when Ahab heard those words, that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. So God reckoned, even though Ahab is just, I mean, it was a terrible person here. Ahab has changed, and the Lord recognized it. And I think what we see here is this true mourning. I would say that this was maybe a good example of the godly sorrow that we saw in Second Corinthians chapter seven, and that God rec God recognized this, and so He sees that Ahab has humbled himself uh, before Him. Now, there's still going to be judgment. There's still going to be some calamities happening, but God does grant Ahab the mercy that He's not going to do this while Ahab is king, but it's going to happen in the days of his son. So God relents on, I guess you would say, the timing of when this judgment is going to take place, this calamity is going to take place. And so again, we see that that changing of that, that you know, different mindset there. Ezra chapter 10. So this is a situation, so this is after the Babylonian captivity. So this is after Nebuchadnezzar you know, there's some various other kings as well. So they're back into the land. They're, they're back in back in Israel here. And we see this situation in which the, the, the men, so these will be the, the nation of Israel, has taken uh, these pagan wives, okay, which they were not supposed to. They had broken the law, okay. Notice what is what is said here. I think this is a very interesting point that's, that's, that's made. And in, in regards to seeing what the people did and what were, what they were willing to do in order to make themselves right with God. It says, Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have transgressed and have taken pagan wives, adding to the guilt of Israel. 
Now, therefore, make confession to the Lord God of your fathers and do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the pagan wives. So they're sinning while they're married to these pagan wives, all right? So as long as they're as long as they're married, they're they're in this continual stage of sin. And so the only way for this sin to stop is them be no longer married uh, to these wives. They have to be separated from them. Okay. And so you think about that. that, that I mean, that's a big deal. And, and you think, of, and, and there are certain situations today that you see what uh, uh, the Lord has said about, you know, marriage and divorce and remarriage and how, you know, what constitutes adultery and in certain situations. If someone remarries, they are actually committing adultery that, you can see and know of people who get themselves in that situation. And it's the same situation as we see here in Ezra chapter 10, that as long as they're married unlawfully in that situation, they're just, you know, they're just continually in the sin of adultery. And the only way for that sin to stop is to separate themselves. And and, and what, what it seems is though, and I think, and I think, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, what we see, and I don't think it's a, uh, you know, I think it's common and, uh, and expected is that when, when somebody is in that situation and they recognize that they have to separate themselves from their wives, that's a, that's a, that's a big deal. You know, that takes some, uh, you know, a great amount of will, uh, uh, to do right, to be willing to, to do those things. And we see a situation with this and, you know, and some people say, well, no, you know, that's, that's too much. That's not reasonable. You know, God would not make me put myself in this situation in which, you know, I may be mourning for this fact that I have to give up my spouse. But this is what is expected. And this is the only way in which these people can be made right. And they were willing to do it. I think this is a great example of what when, when, when people set their minds on doing the right things, uh, that they're willing to give up, you know, a large amount of their life or, you know, all of their life, really, in, in order to make themselves right with God. And we see this with these people that have taken these pagan wives. The only way that they're going to make it right is if they separate themselves from their pagan wives. And that, that's exactly of what they did. Acts chapter 19, we see these people in Ephesus. And, and we, what we'll read of is their change of heart, their change of mind after they hear what Paul uh, comes and preaches to them. He says, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they count up the value of them and a total of 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So these people, they confessed their deeds. They were telling their deeds. And then they come and they start burning up their magic books and it says that the, the books value 50,000 pieces of silver. I don't know what the, the, the monetary value of today that would be. I don't know exactly what what coin they mean by these pieces of silver. But this was a, is obviously worth a lot of money. Uh, that they, they were willing to just burn these things to the ground. They didn't say, oh, well, you know, I won't use this magic book again, but maybe I'll go sell it to this 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 magician down the street or whoever this this crazy person down the street, they they completely get rid of them. Okay, they have no use for them, and they don't want people, other people, uh, reading these books as well. And and so again, uh, we see uh, this change in these people of Ephesus here. Also in Acts chapter twenty six, we see Paul and his change. It says therefore, King Agrippa was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles they shall repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Paul receives the vision. He's blinded. He he, you know, sees Jesus there. He talks with Jesus. It, Jesus tells him what he needs to do, and he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So he did exactly what he was preaching to the Gentiles. He says, repent, that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. This is what Paul did. He repented. He turned to God. And guess what? He did works befitting repentance. He was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He did what he was told to do. 
And so these are several great examples of what repentance looks like. So repentance is it is a change of mind that ultimately leads to a change of action. You know, and we have to be careful with that, that, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we truly have repented. You know, again, being sorry doesn't mean that we repented. Feeling bad about it doesn't mean that we repented. When we repent, we, we, we change. We stop doing those things, you know, and we don't want anything to do uh, with uh, those, those sinful practices as well. It's not just, well, you know, I'm not, I'm just not in a position to not do these things. So that means I repented. No, that, no, even if you were in the position, you would not commit those things. Regardless of what, what's going on, you have just decided that you are not going to commit that sin. And that's what repentance is. And we see these instances of these people that are doing just that uh, in the Old and the New Testament. So I hope this has been useful for y'all. This is the end of my lesson. If you got any questions or comments, feel free to leave them. And, um, you know, I'll try to respond to it. Also, YouTube, we have we have our page, North Columbus Church of Christ, and you can see all our videos there. You can subscribe, comment on our videos. I'll try to keep up with that as well. So, again, I hope this has been useful for y'all. And, and until next time, I hope that y'all have a good day, good night, rather, and a good rest of the week. Thanks.